Welcome to Crime Nation. This is the companion podcast for Crime Nation, the series, which airs Tuesday on The CW at 8 p.m. in the East. This is the place where we take you behind the headlines of some of America's most shocking crimes and give you the scoop on each episode. You'll hear exclusive clips, hear the stories that didn't make the show, and you'll meet the people that bring Crime Nation to life. You are here in Crime Nation. Hey everybody, I'm Brian Enton, News Nation correspondent and contributor for Crime Nation. Crime Nation rolls on. We've been working so hard on it. Uh, these two-hour episodes, the the crime docu series airing on the CW, eight o'clock Eastern Tuesday nights. We've been breaking ground. Last night we had the Lloyd Vallow episode. Uh, what a wild story that is! It all started back in uh, December of 2019. Astonishing everyone watching as the FBI, uh, along with Idaho and Arizona authorities, asked the country for their help in finding missing siblings. Uh, JJ was seven years old and, and Tylee Ryan, Ryan uh, 16 years old. Their mother, Lori Vallow, her new husband, Chad Daybell, uh, they weren't cooperating with police. And at one point, it seemed like they vanished themselves. Uh, in addition, Lori and Chad's previous spouses, they both died in the previous few months, which was very, very suspicious at the time, along with Lori's younger brother, Alex, who would later find out it was all connected, allegedly. Uh, when a search warrant was finally executed on Chad Daybell's property in Idaho, uh, that was June 9th, 2020, I believe, uh, the children uh, were, were sadly found in shallow graves there right on the property. So many questions, still so many questions. That's why this was uh, such a fascinating um, two-hour docu-series, because it's not over. How does a parent get to a place where they kill their own child? It's probably the number one question. Lori Vallow claimed that, um, that she and Chad were redeemed by God to lead the chosen few into salvation, and they, they believed zombies were starting to walk the earth and needed to be eliminated. Zombies. That's what they thought, zombies. Uh, and even if the zombies were their own children, it's like still hard for me to wrap my mind around. The story, again, far from over. Lori sentenced to life in prison for the murder of J.J. and Tylee, but, but now everyone's waiting to see what's going to happen with Chad. He's got his upcoming trial. Will he turn on Lori? Lori didn't turn on Chad during her trial. Her lawyer did sort of at the end, kind of went rogue in closing arguments. But uh, Lori stood by her man. Is Chad also going to? Um, one of the more emotional parts of the Crime Nation episode, I thought, and I thought this too when I was in court when it was described, was the description of when J.J. and Tylee were discovered. Take a listen. Investigators have uh, recovered what's believed to be human remains. This being related to the case of J.J. and Tylee, could this be them? They found pieces of Tylee and she was dismembered and burned. They couldn't even determine her cause of death. But it is determined that Tylee was burned and buried in Chad's yard on September 9th. The police traced Alex's phone and Chad's phone in Chad's yard those early hours on September 9th. We also have satellite footage taken before and after that shows a burial spot. Then 50 feet from there, they found JJ. He was like under a tree, right there in a little shallow grave, just like Tylee. The last Sighting of JJ also comes from Lori's iCloud account. And we now know those were the same pajamas that he was buried in. I want to bring in uh, Lauren Mathias and John Mathias with the Hidden True Crime podcast. And if you caught the episode, uh, then you saw they are really experts on this case. Um, and uh, I've gotten to know Lauren quite well because we go out and cover these trials together. And 
she's uh one of my uh, my buddies so it, it's good to have you you both uh on and um i really appreciate it i, I want to start with you john and one thing i've talked to lauren about a lot we sat next to each other during the Lori ballow trial and i was always asking her this but i've never had the opportunity to ask you john like i always okay. wondered whether Lori really believes this stuff in terms of d does she really believe in the zombies and that her kids were evil or or you know did she just force herself to believe it to cope with the fact that she killed them i mean what, what do you think i think sometimes those two run together but i think that for the most part if i had to guess i think she she does believe it and as far as i can tell she still believes it i think she believed it years ago and she still clings to that belief. But I think also that part of it is, as you said, it's, it's a coping mechanism. It's a way for her to not cope with the reality of what occurred. Do you think now that she's been convicted and, it, you know, has been behind bars for quite some time, John, that she, I mean, does any of it sink in, do you think? <laughs> uh, you know, for, I think for, for you and I, looking at it as, as normal, rational people, it would seem as if that type of environment would lead to some change. But as far as we can tell, I don't, it doesn't appear to have sunk in at all. It appears that she's still entrenched in the same belief system. And as far as we can tell, she hasn't changed much. Yeah, and Lauren, we talked about this in the Crime Nation episode, and you and I saw it during the trial. But just like observing her during that trial was so creepy because she did seem like she wasn't there in a way or she there was a wall up or you know and she was like giddy at times and joking with the lawyer and it was just it, it, hard to watch see whenever things got hard she would turn away and not watch the screen do you remember that brian yes uh, and then there was and then there was that day in court where it was a really hard day we were all there it was it was a day none of us wanted to be there when they were showing the autopsies of the children her children and she asked to be dismissed and i think it was the only time she ever showed any emotion and you know and i asked john about it too and he, and he can give his his thoughts about it but i don't even think it was emotion for her children feeling sad. it was feeling sad for her that she didn't want to be there in court that day to watch the jurors and to watch us see these things or to have her look bad. I, I don't know. I can't put my thoughts into Lori. I don't know what she was thinking. So it's not fair for me to do that. But it was the one day where she really seemed to have some emotion and I still can't figure out what it was for. Of course, Judge Boy said, yeah, no, you've got to sit here. And other than that, she was really dismissive. She, and she, you're right. She never really showed a lot of emotion. I felt like the jurors showed more emotion than she did during her trial. I hate to use this phrase, John, but like there were times she's, I think someone else said this, like she almost seemed like a giddy schoolgirl at times during the trial. Like she would turn to her lawyer, you know, after a really emotional day of just awful testimony that we all listened to. And you just see her lean back in her chair and kind of laughing. And just, it was like, it, it, it was, it was just so strange. Yeah, I, I think some of that is denial, but also I think there's there's at times I think there's almost this smug quality to her in the sense that whatever her belief system is around these crimes, that she believes she's right and she believes that what that the, the children were somehow part of a larger plan and that that us mortals don't understand that. So uh, she kind of, in her view, I think she has access to this special information that would make sense of everything, but she just, she can't share that with other people. So there's almost kind of this arrogant quality there too. And a, and a childish quality too. If she, she often comes across as if she's a little kid, you know, that as you just mentioned, that, that her interactions with the attorneys and kind of the giggling and the, you know, the, the not taking it all that seriously is there's a very childlike quality to that. So much of this, uh, obviously revolves around the Mormon religion and these cult-like beliefs that stem from from that. Um, for those of us not intimately familiar, I know you are, Lauren. Can you explain that a little bit, where all of these beliefs came from? Yeah, um, and I can't explain all of them. If I could explain all of them, uh, we'd really be able to to 
uh, have her figured out because some of them are just really out there. But as far as the the mainstream Mormon church, which is called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they believe in a pre-mortal existence. They believe, you know, in uh, passing away and life after death. And Lori belongs to what I would refer to as a subgroup of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, meaning that she and uh, others that believe like her, Chad Daybell, we don't know if she believes, he, we don't know if he believes or not, but uh, we can get to him later. But this belief system that Lori seems to believe in, I would call a subgroup from the mainstream Mormon church, where they not only believe these basic principles of life after death, but uh, they they mix in this idea of possession, which is in the Bible, and then they call it zombies. In addition to that, they have one belief that just isn't part of the mainstream LDS church, and that is this belief in uh, multiple mortal probations, which might be a fancy way of saying reincarnation, but I wouldn't call it reincarnation necessarily either, because reincarnation, you can come back as a plant or an animal. This this group and what Lori believes is that they were all really famous, important spiritual people in past lives and that they're living again and again and again. And that really this life doesn't even matter that much when it comes to the big picture. She also believes that she's a goddess and that she and others are going to bring in the second coming of Christ. It's very doomsday oriented that the second coming of Christ is on its way, that there will be all these tribulations that we must prepare and the righteous will be saved for this. I would also call a very doomsday centered belief. And it does all revolve around Mormonism, but then it goes even further and even more extreme. Um, In terms of the doomsday and the zombies, I mean, how common is this? Is Are there other groups out there that that believe this and are still around? I would say this subgroup, let's dub this a subgroup. I do see it growing. Does that mean they're all going to murder their children? Not necessarily, but I would say extremist beliefs are dangerous and they're definitely a step in a wrong direction. Um, and maybe this is a question for John, but you know, paranoia, believing that the end is near, none of that's good. None of it. And yes, I would say that this subgroup is certainly growing and these beliefs still linger in a small population of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yes. It, it's disturbing to to think about that. John, how do how does someone like Lori fall into this? I mean, what like what goes on in, in the mind? Yeah, I think Lori Lori has been she was and probably has been looking for something for a long time. And religion, I think, in general, has tended to fill that void for her. When I say looking for something, I mean a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging, some sense of identity. I think those things are typical cults in general. So I kind of see it as her desire to find those elements in her life. And she finds those through Chad Daybell. So I think she's she's always been looking to feel special, to have this unique sense of purpose, to really feel like she belongs somewhere. And I think Chad Babel really fulfilled that for her. It seemed like she was never satisfied, always looking for something better, always feeling like her yeah. life was special. Right, exactly. Yeah, I think she, she wanted to have, for, for lack of a better term, I think she wanted to feel at home. She wanted to feel some measure of peace and contentment. I think she's, she's always had these internal demons that she struggled with. And she's probably always had this, inner turmoil that's really haunted her for many years. So I think she, in order to overcome those qualities, I think she really found something special with Chad Daybell and his belief system and the entire belief system she adopted. Lauren, Crime Nation did a really good job of kind of getting us up to where things stand now. There were a lot of new tidbits and and, and video elements, um, but from here, where where do we stand legal wise? I mean, Chad, Ch- I think it's Chad's trial is coming up in in April. Is that right? That's right. Yes, I I hope that we can be there together again. But that would be a, that would be the a treat. That's the one nice thing about covering these awful things. 
But uh, what do you expect from that? I mean, do you think one thing I've wondered about Lori didn't turn on Chad um, and it, for the most part stayed loyal to him. Um, do you think he's going to do the same? Do we have any indication which way that's going to go? I don't think he's going to stay loyal to Lori. And one reason I think that, well, I think it for multiple reasons, but uh, Chad's attorney's given us a big hint saying that there wasn't much of a defense in Lori's case, but there's going to be a really big defense in Chad's trial. And I think what he's implying to is really the only defense you have in this situation is to blame the other person when you have a co-defendant. And there have been little hints as to Chad's children saying that they believe that their father was framed. I think that Chad is ready and willing to throw Lori under the bus. And there is going to be a lot of pointing fingers at her. And I think the reason why Lori's attorneys were held back quite a bit during her trial was because she did not want them to throw Chad under the bus. And I think, you know, at the very end, they finally did in the closing arguments. And that made her angry because she really didn't want that. And so I think what we're going to see in Chad's trial is a lot of this is all Lori's fault. This is her belief system. And she's the one to blame for everything. And he'll say it's, it's her kids, her children, right, that she's the one who ultimately made those decisions. I mean, I think there's a lot they're going to attempt to do with Lori. Yeah, and, and Lauren made an interesting point. You know, she didn't turn on Chad and didn't testify about that, but it was it was clearly a crazy moment in the closing and just did that on his own, just, I guess, trying to come up with some kind of defense. But, I mean, isn't most of the evidence, doesn't it show that Chad sucked Lori into all this? Yeah, I think if, if there had been a trial with those two together, I think the jury would have been even more likely to have found Chad guilty, probably. But, but I don't know. I mean, obviously, there's going to be a separate jury here. So different group, different ideas. We'll, we'll see what happens. It's going to be really interesting. And then, uh, Lauren, Lori, there's more legal matters pending for her, too, right? Can you talk, explain that a little bit? Yeah, I've been following along. In fact, she appeared in, in court recently in Arizona. We just had a hearing because she faces charges in Arizona now in the murder of her late husband, Charles Vallow, who was killed July 11th, 2019. There is so much to keep track of in, in terms of all the moving parts of this case. And you're, I don't know how you, how you keep it all straight because <laughs> between uh, Lori and Chad, they've, they're accused of a lot of awful things. I want to ask you, though, Lauren, um, in the Crime Nation episode, we heard a lot from JJ's grandparents, Kay and, and Larry, uh, and they've just been through so much. And they were in court almost every single day with Lori's trial. Uh, how, how are I know you're close to them, Lauren. How are they doing? You know, they they have their uh, apartment solidified because they plan to be there every single day of Chad Daybell's trial. They want to see justice for JJ and Tylee and Tammy. And they are so grateful also that Arizona is going to make sure that Charles sees justice as well. You know, one thing they said to me, uh, because it's taken so long, right? Everything happened in 2019. They're tired. They're worn out. They've been doing this for so long. But she said that Charles Vallow uh, would have said, Kay said this. Kay said that Charles Vallow would have said to her, Take care of the kids and Tammy first and then worry about me later. And so Kay and Larry are really grateful that that Chad is about to finally go to trial, that hopefully they'll be able to close this chapter and then they can move forward and work uh, on, and focus on justice for Charles. I also know that John is pretty close to Larry. I think it's it's been a long, drawn-out process for both of them. I think it's taken a big emotional toll, but... They're really passionate about finding justice for all the victims, and I think that's what really drives them. They're just so inspiring, and the fact that they have the strength now to go through another trial, and they have to uproot their whole lives, and like you said, rent an apartment, and these things go on for months and months and months where they're away from home. Um, it just shows the amazing strength that people can have. So I've always been so inspired by them and honestly inspired by both of you too, uh, Lauren and John. You both just do such a good job and you cover these cases um, with such integrity and a focus on the victims. And I'm so glad you were part of the, the Crime Nation uh, episode. And I look forward to working with you both in the future. And thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk with me. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for having us. 
I want to bring in now Vicky Song, uh, who was the producer of the Lori Vallow Crime Nation episode, um, and she did such an incredible job. Vicky, it's it's good to talk to you again. It's been a while since we were working on the episode. I, I was thinking about. I mean, you've you've done so many crime stories over the years, but I feel like with with Lori's case. There's just something about it that really is like next level disturbing, I guess, because there's kids involved. But I don't know. It just it, it always bothered me more than than other cases that I've covered. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I think with this one also, because I've been doing crime cases for about a decade or more, maybe. And with this one, it stuck out so much because I think it's yes, there's children, but it's also just so layered the amount of deceit. And in so many ways and how so much happened so fast and how quickly everything escalated. And it's also, I've never worked on any kind of case or story where it, it, there's just so much happening all at once. It's not just, um, kid, there's kidnapping, there's um, a religious radicalization from two different, completely different sides also. And then there's all these victims that keep disappearing and then people are uh, dying of natural causes. And then there's also fraud. And yeah, I don't, I can't, I'm sure there's more. And I, I can't even list them all off the top of my head. But there's just so many aspects to this. And it's just so tragic also because um, uh, it doesn't stop. Like there's still, what, three more trials at least? Two more at least? Trials yeah, are? it's hard to keep track of. I mean, you said it. They, there's, there's so much. Um, there's so many deaths. There's so much. There, it's just. It, I remember when I first started covering the trial, I had to just take a deep dive into everything because um, it's it's complex, which I think is one of the things that's so great about the fact that you had two hours with the episode. Um, you were really able to explain it because it 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 takes a lot. Yeah, and um, and it's amazing that two hours still didn't feel like enough because there's just so much that happened. And that was actually one of the toughest things is like, what do we keep? Because there was just, there was so much to this. And then there was, you know, so many people that um, they had affected, not just like the um, our five victims that are deceased, but it's also her niece, her, um, her other, um, Lori's other family members, Chad's other family members. You know, they've actually just hurt a lot of other people along the way that we don't talk about as much also. Yeah, um, I was talking to Lauren and John Mathias, who you interviewed for the episode, uh, and telling them that I think people still struggle with what Lori really believes, um, like whether she was truly brainwashed and still believed those things during the trial in terms of her kids being zombies and that she was actually like helping them or if it's almost a defense mechanism to sort of cope with the fact that she killed her children. It, I don't know. It still feels kind of like an open question. Yeah, because it's also, um, you, there's no really making sense of, you know, it's hard to make sense of someone murdering anybody, let alone their own family members, let alone their own children. And then adding like the justification. So it just, it does feel like she kind of doubled down because there's no other place to go. Like, do you either come to terms with what you've done or you just say, screw it, or, yeah. Right, Do no, totally. To just believe it, and I think that's kind of what was our question, will be everyone's question, it was our question going in, and it's still our question when we were done. It's like, um, yeah, because it's, it's hard to make sense of it, and I think John Matthias had said it, where you kind of have to take some rationale out of it, because all of this is just based on a belief system, and who knows what it is, and... If it's just your convictions and beliefs, then you kind of have to take rationale out of it to a degree, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, I know. It's a good point. Um, Lori was in court again recently in Arizona. Yeah. Uh, we did the story on News Nation. I was I was watching the video. I don't know if you've seen it. She comes into the courtroom and she's smile. She's just got this big smile and she's giddy, almost like she was during the murder trial um, in Idaho, but but even more so. And her hair was all done. Um, apparently she uses like toilet paper rolls to like curl her hair. Um, but I don't know. It just, it's so disturbing to see her like that. It's almost like she's oblivious to everything going on around her. Yeah. I think you and I had spoken about that before also about how, you know, in her court appearances, it's almost as though, um, she's enjoying the attention a bit, if you could yeah. say, um, 
Yeah. And it's like, how do you even make sense of that? Like, there's so many. Yeah. How do you make sense of that? It's like, are you really? I want to get to, or is that another aspect of her needing to kind of lean into this entire persona that she's now, she is now, or the person she is now, I guess. When you yeah. explored in the episode, it, it seemed like she always sort of craved attention in some way. Yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah, we tried to explore just like her background of like what led her to wanting all of this because, but it's hard. I think it's just still in the end, we're always just trying to make sense of it. We're trying to figure out like what what led to all this and how how she got to that place. Yeah, no, for sure. One of the big parts of the episode, uh, there were these private text messages, new revelations from the private investigator hired by Lori's parents to find the children. Um, and we learned that Lori and Chad's relationship, it, it was really like a perfect storm with warped religion. I mean, religion has so much to do with all of this, it seems. Yeah, I think it goes back to what uh, Dr. Matthias had said about it. it's about faith and conviction. So it's like it's religious. It's also, you know, religion is, you know, is faith based. Okay, It's like you believe. And so, um, yeah, and I think it ties behind all this about how because Lori and Chad, they were radicalizing completely separately on their own um, before they ever met. And so I think that's how it became the perfect storm. Like they were both kind of brewing on their own ends in Idaho and Arizona or and all the other places both of them kept moving around to. And then when they met, it was really, yeah, it was just like the perfect um, worst formula, worst storm. Looking ahead, just lastly, I mean, there's still a lot yet to happen with this with this story involving Lori and, and Chad and Chad's now going to go on trial. I mean, what do you expect? To, what are you looking for with that trial? I mean, what, what do you, I'm just wondering like, is, is he going to turn on Lori? Cause we didn't really see that happen with her case. I mean, at the end, her lawyer kind of went rogue and did and turned on, on Chad, but we didn't really see her turn on Chad. But I, I I guess that could possibly happen now. He could turn on her and, and try to say it was all her fault. Yeah, I think um, I just want more answers for the family members. You know, there's still so many questions out there, like who really started these conversations? Who did what? Um, I forgot someone had said it. Best, of like everyone, you know, even like Charles's death, everyone who was there has died uh, right. the day Charles, you know, um, besides Lori. And so... Yeah, I just hope that the families get some more answers to what happened to the children. And then once Lori's on trial in Arizona for Charles, like what really happened with Charles? And so I just hope the families get more answers. And I think we all, I mean, it's already been kind of, we already see it in the um, pre-trial proceedings that Chad, it looks like Chad will um, turn on Lori a bit, but it's like, how much can you turn on her? There's a lot right. still to She's already convicted, so right. yeah, really turn on her. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. And you yes. mentioned the families. I mean, you in the episode, you had Kay and Larry, and you just, I mean, you can't help but just feel so terrible for them, the grandparents uh, and everything they've been through. And, and we've talked to them. I mean, they plan to also be at Chad's trial. They've yeah. already rented an apartment, and it's it's just such a disruption for their life and such an emotional roller coaster. So it really is all about the families you're right and what they continue to go through and i think you did a really good job exploring that in in the episode so uh, i'm glad i got to work with you uh vicky and i appreciate you coming on and uh we've got a ton more episodes to come in the series murdoch is coming up next there's still idaho so uh, i think people are enjoying it and learning a lot especially since they're two hour episodes and uh thanks for taking the time vicky yeah thank you Crime Nation airing Tuesday nights, 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 Central on The CW. Uh, and we've got more episodes to come. We've got busy weeks coming up with Crime Nation. Thanks for being a part of Crime Nation for this episode of the podcast. Don't forget to watch the show, which airs Tuesdays on The CW at 8 p.m. Eastern. This has been Crime Nation, the podcast. Thank you.